Hello everyone, welcome to game two of the World Championship in chess. Uh, this time Ding had the white pieces and Nepo had the uh, black pieces. But let's just dive right in. We had d4, knight to f6, and this is pretty common for black. Oftentimes they like to get the uh, king's Indian defense setup going. And uh, even if they don't, I mean this is just a move that you're going to kind of want to do one way or another. One of my old favorite moves on white was to play bishop here to g5 to kind of take people out of that theory just because it's so common that a lot of lines come from it. But uh, it's not very common in pro play, unfortunately. We see c4. He takes advantage of the center um, since black chose not to. We see e6. Make a room for the bishop. Uh, looking for a potential c5 move. Knight to f3. And then we see d5. Um, h3 and this move I personally think is kind of weird I don't know that this is uh, a normal move just because the bishop is not going to be resting on this square uh, since e6 is blocking it and then um, the knight doesn't really have any business here right now because it needs you know like a helper on the c5 square for instance to um, help it out so uh, it looks a little weird to me um, I'm just looking right here at the side now, and it says uh, much will be said about this curious and rare choice as early as move four, probably an influence of the creative GM report, one of Ding's seconds. So it looks like this move was kind of weird to them as well. So this isn't just me who has no idea of the theory here. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, to me, like opening wise. So there has to be like some further thinking behind it, or you know, just trying to get your opponent out of uh, prep or to uh, you know, kind of spin him for a loop type thing. So he's going to take the pawn. Uh, obviously, if you allow white to take, you know, something like this, then the bishop can eventually come here, and then you are taking away a good square of that bishop. So I don't see a problem with taking right here. I think that's rather good. Uh, e3, of course. Bishop is looking to take on c4, find a good home for itself. We're going to see c5. Bishop's going to take. Uh, he's going to go a6. Uh, again, that looks a little weird to me. I don't think they said anything was weird about that right now. Um, so maybe this is more so normal, but that also looks a little odd to me because I don't think the bishop will want to find a home on b5, but who knows. Castle, knight c6, knight c3, we get b5, and you don't want to drop back here to b3, I don't think, because then you see c4 and you're kind of gonna be pressed for some uh, good squares. Um, so he goes the other way to d3. We're going to see bishop coming here to b7. a4. Uh, just kind of contesting this, um, seeing what he wants to do with it. Seeing if he wants to push it forward, you know, make it a little more weaker. Or if he would like to uh, capture, thus, you know, kind of ruining this side of his pawns. Um, we'll see. He chooses to go ahead with b4 and push. We're going to see knight to e4 offering the trade. He does not opt to take it, instead putting double pressure on it. Knight is going to take on f6. And Nepo took back with a pawn. And this, for me, I would feel kind of scared actually playing this as black, just because now you don't have the safest place to castle um, on either side. Uh, you kind of can go to... Um, e7 and be you know more or less happy with the kind of defense that's offered since the center is kind of closed right now there's not really any threats that are going on here but it's always kind of scary to be in the center uh, not to mention that if the c5 pawn eventually gets taken then that becomes kind of a threatening square for you we see e4 uh, sorry, I think the reason we see e4 is so the queen no longer has to be uh, play guard duty for Knight of three. If this bishop were to take now, that would 100% be awful for white, um, because then the king is just going to be out in the open. So I think that was kind of the thought process behind the move e4. We see a c4, and now you're kind of left with a choice as to where you want to back up to. Uh, I don't think you want to go to b1 necessarily. Um, there are times when you do want to put your bishop on the last rank, but typically the times that you do so are when like your rook is already on e1 for example and your thought process is to just keep your bishop uh, until the late game and then your bishop will just be stronger once more pieces are traded off but you do that kind of after you move your pieces out of the way into their comfortable squares 
Um, so I don't think you would want to go B1 in this example. Um, I think that C2 or E2 would be pretty normal moves to make. I don't know which one is going to be chosen, but you probably want to defend this, so I would guess C2. Okay. Uh, we're going to see queen to, excuse me, c7. Bishop comes here to uh, d2. Rook goes to g8. So now he has a couple of threats over here looking at ding. We're going to see the rook get paired up against the queen. And then, again, this is another move that looks rather scary to me and I would not recommend to a new player. But putting the king and the queen in the same line as a rook is kind of just like asking for trouble. Obviously, I think Nepo has things under control, but definitely scary for me and or, you know, like a new player. Um, yeah, so we see bishop to d3, and the idea is you obviously cannot take because then, you know, the queen is going to fall. And he moves the king out of the way, but, you, you know, same thing. You still can't take the pawn for at least one more move until you move the queen out of the way. So we see the rook take the center, and now I would expect the bishop to come back to f1. Uh, we see f5, um, and this looks like it would be a free pawn. However, I think something like rook d5 were to occur. I'm not entirely sure. I'm just going to play this out and see what the computer says. So that's fine. So what if you just take once? Rook takes d4. Ah, okay. And that can't be captured because then you have this threat coming. And obviously mate here, so you have to go that way. That does not look comfortable whatsoever. All right, so I see why that's losing. And then what you have to do is you have to defend those things simultaneously, kind of. Oof, that is a good move. Okay, so f5, he's going to drop back. Now you could see that he's being pressed back. All of his pieces are kind of getting into this quadrant, whereas Nepo is slowly taking over, you know, extending his reach and his control squares, you know, over the entire board. <clears throat> uh, knight goes to c6. Uh, time to find a better home for the knight. It served its purpose, I would say, you know, being on a5 for a little bit protecting these pawns and his advance and such, but it's no longer needed. It could more or less, you know, start attacking some squares. We see bishop to g5, and Nepo takes this. Um, and then he takes the pawn. So he's okay going down that exchange because now he has a lot better position. Um, then I would say that white has, so it's okay to lose a rook that wasn't really doing a whole lot. Um, he's pretty much using that rook um, to progress his center game, kind of like a, uh, I don't know what the term I'm thinking of, but it's kind of like, not necessarily a trap, but just kind of like a bait. Like he's bringing the opponent over to this side, now he's going to start his attack on the other one. Uh, Ding just chooses to kind of avoid this threat entirely and just goes to queen h5. We see f6 kicking the knight. So now the queen is kind of one trapped and two out of place. Uh, not trapped in the sense that like he's going to lose the queen, like he could still, you know, if he wanted to, you know, maneuver out. However, maybe not these squares, but he can still maneuver out, but it's going to take a lot of moves. He's not doing anything here right now. So kind of just no good all the way around. He's going to take the bishop. Then he's going to take the other pawn. And now things look very, very scary for uh, white. These pawns are marching. He has protection from both of his pieces. This bishop at the right moment will also come in. And once again, this queen is doing literally nothing right now. And if you ever choose to move the queen, for example, to try to free it, then black is going to take the knight on f3, and then your king is going to be in a whole lot of trouble. We see rook to d2. So I think he's trying to uh, clear up some of this pressure, recapture, and then the queen can come rejoin the game. And he's trying to kind of untangle himself from this mess. 
but he's not having any of it. He just moves the bishop here. You see the king go over to h1 um, to avoid this check, I believe, although I'm not entirely sure. And now we see c3. And Nepo is pushing to get a pass pawn. And he has a pass pawn. So things now look very grim for uh, Ding Liren. Um, he can't even go rook b1 to kind of like switch up pressure just because he has control over this square. Same thing here because the pawn controls that. Um, once this rook gets off this line, then this bishop can move as well. And you once again have control of the d file with the rook being capable of coming to d1 at the right moment. And uh, Ding Liren chooses to go rook d4. Um, he didn't really have a whole lot of other squares to go to. I mean, maybe rook a2 or rook um, e2, I'm not sure. But uh, he just pushes. The queen is coming to defend. And one option is to take this, and that does look particularly scary. However, instead, um, Nepo chose to go e5. And e5 actually traps the rook, excuse me. Oh. And pretty much, <coughs> if you capture that, obviously you're losing. If you go here, takes, pawn takes here, can't go there. If you go here, you're blocking the queen uh, reach to the c1 square, so he's gonna promote into a queen. If you go here, the pawn just takes, obviously. If you go here, queen takes, here, bishop takes. So the rook has no squares to go. So on this move, he actually resigned. So. Ian won uh, game two. He won on black, which is very, very good. <coughs> Anyone who is just kind of watching the World Chess Championship and doesn't know too much about professional chess, uh, when you're playing black uh, in like rating levels such as these, you know, like 27, 2800, stuff like that, normally you'd be lucky to get like a draw with black. Well, I wouldn't say a draw on black would be lucky. I'd say that's pretty common. Draws are kind of the norm at this level. But, uh, you know, that's kind of what you're hoping for, right? Like, you're hoping to hold the game, um, especially in a world championship match where both teams have, like, a lot of preparation that they did. You definitely want to kind of hold off, you know, whatever they've been scheming up as, uh, what's it called, as black. But he managed to get a win on the board. Um, so he's up in the series right now. And we're probably going to see some more exciting games because I don't think that Ding Liren wants to stay, you know, a full point down. But um, I enjoyed that game. I thought it was very good. Um... A lot of weird moves um, that end up putting a lot of pressure on the white side. Um, the king ended up castling literally into like the middle of nowhere. Like there's no protection here anywhere, but he's just like covering it with the pieces. So I thought it was a very cool game. I hope you guys enjoyed as well, and I hope to catch you guys in game three.